Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to, to my, my Lunch and Learn talk. So let's just a quick introduction to who am I. Um, I'm a senior engineering consultant here at Team Consulting. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer with uh, 17 years experience. So about 13 of that was in the automotive industry before I moved and spent the last four in medical devices. Uh, I'm a Six Sigma black belt, which I guess is, is relevant for, for DOE, which is, I guess, the subject of today's talk. And just to give you a flavor, my typical role is I have a, a technical project lead or, or project manager for, for various kind of projects here. I've been lucky enough to get involved in sort of drug delivery, med tech, um, surgical, lots of different areas. Okay, so, so moving on, um, just to kind of get, get a bit of a, a kind of intro into this subject, I've, I've taken this quote from our website, and essentially it says that here at Team, we we, we create medical devices that, that users love. And, and as, a, as a mechanical engineer, I kind of interpret that as meaning, you know, we're trying to go beyond just, just, just making devices that are, are compliant to the regulations and are functional, because that's essentially the bare minimum of getting something in the market. We, we sort of actively try to kind of make the devices that we're involved with as, as kind of as good as they can be, you know, to optimize them to some extent. Um, the problem with that aspiration um, is that, if it kind of if we take it too far and sort of trying to do too much optimization and too much too much work, um, it can result in kind of cost overruns um, and other things that, that could could fundamentally sort of jeopardize a product reaching the market. Uh, I think that's saying, I think it was attributed to Voltaire, uh, "Don't let perfect be the enemy of good." And I think that's kind of a appropriate thing we could, should consider. So just trying to kind of visualize that a little bit, I've kind of gone back to the project management textbook. And there's a, a kind of example that gets shown a lot, which is, I guess, called the scope triangle, which tries to relate the kind of concepts of time, cost, and, and, and quality. And essentially, what I'm saying here is that, you know, we strive here to, to make the devices as good quality as they can be. Um, the problem with that is that if, if done kind of inappropriately, it can, as I said, drive up time, drive up cost, um, which which really isn't 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 what's what we need, particularly in the early stage of development, where you know budgets are tight, um, and 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 we don't want kind of striving for perfection, um, ultimately resulting in a council project. Um, I think there, there 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 there's a balance somewhere. So so without kind of stretching the metaphor too far, uh, what we want to do as a kind of engineering team is to to find tools methodologies techniques um, to be kind of cleverer about how we approach projects and in doing so um, we should try and sort of squeeze as much quality um, into the program as we can and I've kind of put the emphasis on early stage um, sort of concept development work and you know that is a big risk if, 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 if costs are high but it's also a big opportunity um, to to, 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 because at that point, the, the, the kind of cost of change is low. And so the kind of value you gain through a, a, a full project from developing a really deep understanding of a system early is it, it, really very valuable. So it's a kind of difficult stage, the early stage. You know, you, 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 you've got cost constraints, but you've got tremendous opportunity for, for, for seeing benefits flow through the entire project. So, I'm a big advocate in terms of trying to to to, to make the engineering activities more efficient of, of of looking at what I've called here a, a kind of model based approach to to development. Um, that is kind of opposed to to to, to maybe a, a kind of a more I say traditional maybe that's the wrong word but a kind of a, a more reactive approach where you spend a lot of time and effort building testing, seeing if there's any failures, addressing the failures, building again, testing again, and, and, and sort of looking at things reactively. I think, I'm, as I said, I'm a big advocate of sort of proactive development. And, and I think this phrase model-based development is quite appropriate here, although it does have kind of multiple meanings around systems engineering as such. Uh, the way I take about it, the way I, I look at it is, um, if we can sort of use a, a, a predictive model um, that allows us to, uh, or we can develop a predictive model that allows us to essentially optimize the system in a kind of virtual environment where the, the cost and time overheads of doing so are, are, are much, much less. 
than in the physical environment. It gives real opportunities to, to not only understand what's important, but understand the kind of complex effects and how, and how um, different aspects of the system interact. Um, I've, I've put a couple of equations because, you know, I think we want to talk about DOE, but, but I think this, this subject is a bit, a bit broader than that. And, and often um, by really understanding the kind of fundamental physical principles, as I've shown in the kind of first text box, it allows you to, to build math models, essentially. And there's, there's some examples, and here's a, one in particular is very um, commonly encountered in the drug delivery world about flow through um, through, a, through a needle and the relationship between the kind of jump of the needle and the, the, the fluid properties and the pressure drop in the flow rate, et cetera. Um, there, there, there are already kind of well-established principles out there that allow us to do this kind of fairly, fairly easy, easily because, you know, the work's been done, been done for us. You know, an example of the syringe, it's a kind of simple, very kind of classical formula, but there are kind of more complex systems, you know, like on the right-hand side there, I've, I've put a kind of image of some CFD analysis that we, we did a while ago. And again, you know, it's, it's building on the, I guess in this context, it's like in the Navier-Stokes equations of understanding how flow interacts you know, here it's going to compile with a big kind of solving unit and a lot of computational power to allow the calculation to happen. But ultimately, by understanding what's happening physically, it, it opens up the opportunity to build models um, and optimize the models. And then uh, sort of counter to the, the example of doing lots of building and testing and kind of being reactive, testing is kind of performs quite a different function here. And the, the testing is used to, to, to validate model performance and check that what, what 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 you're predicting in the model makes sense, and then ultimately it's 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 used there as a kind of overcheck to make sure that when you get an answer, um, at the end that it that it's true to reality. So I'm a, a huge fan of, of of kind of this general framework because I think this kind of really does um, help to to streamline the process and get kind of a lot of understanding into a, in, in, into a project quickly. But there are a lot of systems where you don't have these kind of convenient. Um, um, kind of principles that are well established that allow you to kind of adequately explain the performance using formulas or or or, 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 or conventional software packages. There's lots of systems that that, that are either too complicated, um, uh, or 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 are kind of too time-consuming to, to to model. Which means that practically going through this the same um, process is, is is very difficult. And this is kind of where sort of design of experiments come in. It allows us to, to to sort of leverage the the kind of the fast paced, low cost kind of optimization understanding element of this process, without necessarily the the the, the kind of basic underlying understanding of the of the of the physical principles and having equations to, to back that out back that up. So so how does it do that? And what 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 is design of experiments? So DOE. So, um, so it's essentially a way of, of trying to understand, to interrogate um, the performance of a system and essentially create a, a transfer function that, that links a set of inputs or, or kind of factors, as they're sort of called in, in kind of DOE speak, I guess, to the system output or the, or the response. Um, it, it tries to do this in a way that's kind of efficient, you know, so it generally, for this type of analysis, looking at the systems with a, a large number of factors, so probably the minimum of, of three, I think anything below three is, is, is actually quite easy to visualize. I think above three, um, and, you know, the, the, the power and the kind of efficiencies you can gain in this sort of DOE experimental um, frameworks means that it, it, it really becomes very, very useful. Um, what the system, what, what the process also does, it considers all the inputs together. Um, a kind of more, again, a more traditional way of looking at experiments is to keep everything the same and change one factor. And that's really great for understanding what that factor does, but it doesn't tell you how different factors um, influence each other. So if there's kind of compounding factors where, where, where two, three or more things contribute to, 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 to a, single, a single effect in the system. Um, I guess a key thing just to, to highlight here is that it, w w when you're trying to understand a, a system appropriate for a DOE and inputs and outputs, you know, there's, there's certain kind of 
not rules, but 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 ways to to, to look at the data uh, to get most value out of it. And so these systems generally work much better with with variable data. So that's essentially variable the data that has a number next to it, as opposed to kind of attribute data, which is a yes or no or pass or fail type criteria. This is particularly true for the for the response. Um, and I think if, if you do have systems that you're trying to model using DOE where you don't have a, a kind of variable output, I think I'd almost suggest we kind of you try and sort of be creative. Is, is, is there a way that you can, um, instead of just saying, yes, it passed or no, it failed, is, 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 is there some other measure that you can do that, that can at least give you some, some level of granularity in that response? And then same with the input factors, um, I think, Variable data is good. We can handle attribute data. It does kind of mean that the, 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 the models produced by the system kind of get, get split. And because you, you can't get a kind of function that describes kind of two discrete um, systems particularly, particularly easily. Um, just in this whole kind of data control um, discussion, I think there's also a, a point to, 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 to look, look out for in terms of the quality of data. And there are other tools as the DOE kind of generally sits under this kind of Six Sigma toolkit, although it can very much be used as a standalone thing. There's tools such as like Gauge R&R where you're looking at, you know, is a system repeatable and, and reproducible, e.g. If, if a different person operates it, can it does it produce the same effect? And I think these, these tools kind of go, go well with this in terms of ensuring that the data you, you get out is, is robust. So, so what does a DOE kind of do and I've, I've kind of tried to simplify it right down to the the basics and and i've tried to describe it here in this kind of sort of two-dimensional frame where you've got along the x-axis that uh, an input or a factor and along the y-axis you've got a system response and so essentially what the design of experiments is 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 collecting data points so there's those kind of methodologies around how to structure a test plan to collect data points so, so you get a set of data points there's then a process about fitting some kind of mathematical curve surface multi-dimensional shape to this to this data point or data cloud um, that has a has a has a, a, a kind of essentially a mathematical equation attached to it um, there's an element of checking that that, that 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 model that you've created fits with the data that you've you've measured and then once that's established um, you can then use that model to predict um, results on, on in areas of the of the model that you didn't test. So again, it shows that the, the power of the model means that you're not restricted to to where your to where, where your test data data sits. So I've done this here in a, in this kind of two dimensional form because it's easy to visualize. But really, what 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 would happen in a conventional DOE is this would be done over you know a wide a wide range of factors. So you'd end up with kind of a multi dimensional space. That becomes uh, a lot more difficult um, to to visualize as such. So this is just the process I've just discussed in in, in kind of a slightly different form. So and and I'm going kind of in the next few slides, I've got I've got a few kind of essentially sort of practical kind of hints and tips type pages looking at each stage of the process and and kind of things to look out for, things that that that, that, that we found useful here at team to think about. But essentially reiterating it, you the first stage is developing a plan. So what data do you plan to collect? You know, what 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 is the what's the range of the data that you'll use as your input? Uh, what things are controllable, what things aren't. You then collect the data and then you analyze the data. So you're trying to fit some kind of mathematical function to that data. It could be a complex function, it could be a, a, a simple function. Um, you then go through a process of checking that this function um, matches your data appropriately. And then when you've got confidence in your model, based on that, then you can use the model to, to, to do optimization or to build a, a further understanding into your system. And this is all without, without really any prior knowledge at all of, 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 of what, what actually is happening in, in, in the system itself. And, and in many ways, the mathematics doesn't, doesn't care. It's just looking at comparing the inputs to the outputs as, as per the previous kind of curve fitting or, or, or regression um, analysis as showed in the, in the previous slide. So I just nipped through, I know we don't have a huge amount of time today, so I just got a slide for each of these, each of these items that hopefully will give you a little sort of practical insight into the kind of things we, we, we think about here at Team. So the first area is experimental design. So I think 
the objective uh, of this is to is to gather uh, an appropriate amount of data um, to, to 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 provide the model or the information that you're looking to achieve, um, while minimising measurement effort. Because there's always the opportunity of measuring more, but generally measurements and testing is is, is time consuming and expensive. So we want to try and try and minimise that. Um, on the right hand side there, there's there's uh, there's a number of representations. I won't I won't go through them all, but this is sort of sort of typical way of representing in in a, at least in a three dimensional space, which is about as big as you can kind of um, visualize sensibly. Um, a few different options, and they kind of go from kind of simplified sort of factorial type designs through to designs more more applicable to kind of optimization through to, to uh, at the bottom right there are some more kind of random space uh, cloud data cloud type systems which are, are maybe a bit more typical of sort of machine learning type type systems um, so what what would my kind of tips be about in terms of setting up experimental design i'd say you know from the beginning consider what the, what the, what the study is for you know is the study for just ruling in or out various factors and what the effect they have. So e.g. E does, I've got 10 different inputs, which ones of them has the biggest effect on the output, which ones do I need to focus my attention on? And that's generally called a screening, a screening DOE, and, and that allows you to use some of the simpler sort of factorial designs where you can kind of minimize, minimize um, data collection, data collection effort. Um, however, if you're looking to um, do some kind of optimization where you're looking for a function with some kind of curvature parameters and other things where you're looking to explore sort of maximums and minimums and, 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 the, and this kind of thing for optimization purposes you generally need some more data and, and, and more data that covers a broader range of or a broader spread of each factors um, range as such um, yeah. Fractionate designs, and there's a second point to save measurement effort. So that this is a useful task, but it, a useful activity. But beware of confounding effects, and confounding effects essentially mean that you you lose the ability to understand what what some of the interactions have. So you know, normally you can maintain the the, the, the first order um, relationships. So what does factor A affect on, on the result? What does factor B? But as you as you reduce the number of test points in your test plan, which is essentially what 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 what, what, what fractional designs are, um, you make um, it more difficult to see some of the higher order effects. Um, and there's quite a lot of theory backing up all that. Um, choosing appropriate levels for each factor, so you need to make sure that you're working in a suitable range of operation. What, 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 what's the what, what's the what's the high limits of your input? What's the low limits of your inputs? Um, and and that that might change as you go through the experiment. You might you might you might want to start big, and then work at where you want to go, and then focus on more. And, and, and I probably suggest that's a, that, that's that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Um, randomized data points really useful. If you take lots of data points over the course of a couple of days, and you and you start with the one end of the input spectrum, and then end in the far end, and go up gradually how can you differentiate the fact the fact that the inputs changed or that the fact you've gone from monday tuesday wednesday to thursday and there's some kind of time effect so randomizing allows you to kind of get rid of some of these systematic errors and um, use lots of repeated points in your test piece in your in your test program to try and make sure you get a view of stability and to make sure that that, that you can always like return to the same point and check that you get more or less the same answer. And if you don't, it gives you a view for how much your variability is in the in the study. Um, and then the last kind of the last couple of points is, is don't be too precious about you know there's a lot of theoretical models about how to do a test plan, but ultimately you can run the analysis and and the other elements of the DOE process very quickly. So you don't need to be too precious about it, and you can almost start analysing as soon as you get data. So you could you could generate a big plan that has multiple repeats, but you really can start analysing it very quickly, and you can decide whether you need to do the repeats or not, kind of on the fly. So I'd you know be very I'd encourage people using this to 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 sort of don't don't set your plans in stone, you know, be 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 flexible about how you go about about things, and then also if you've already got data either import that into your experiment already or 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 don't don't collect new data the, the, the rest of the process is 
is accessible to having data sets that are already available, even if they've not specifically been designed for, um, for DB purposes. Then looking at model training. So essentially this is a kind of mathematical curve fit exercise. Key tips are, you know, think about like sort of the counter to what I, what I just said is, you know, look at what models you want to do when you're designing experiments so that you don't limit yourself. And um, there's lots of experimental models that you can pick from like simple linear models that can just give kind of very general trends to kind of more complex kind of quadratic, quadratic type things or higher high order polynomials. But there's also a kind of whole world of sort of neural network type machine learning algorithms, which essentially do the same thing. You know, the, the kind of world of AI is based on, you know, machine learning is, look, is comparing inputs and output and, and, and building some kind of um, um, transfer function um, based on a whole bunch of coefficients. Um, so it's, it's, it's fundamentally the same thing. Um, just maybe the software package you used to do is, is, is slightly different. Um, beware of overfitting data. So in, in the examples down the right hand side, that it's the same data set, but I've just kind of got into a really high order polynomial and it, it gives a really great R squared value, which we'll go into that in a minute, which says that the fit's really good. But I think all we're really doing here is just fitting to the noise of the experiment. So you need to be a bit careful that you don't try to make, don't just make the model more and more and more complex just to to make it fit the data you happen to have. Um, I said before, don't wait till you've got all the data points to, 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 to use them and, and start the experiment and start the analysis because this, you know, this step is, is really quick. You know, you, we, we, it can be done in seconds really. The, the time consuming bit is the collecting of the data. So don't, don't wait. And then, you know, experiment with transforming factors, you know, an example could be if you've got some kind of mechanical system that's got some kind of bending element and you've, you've, one of your input was the, the diameter of, a, of an element, as an example, you could say, well, actually uh, transform that diameter to a, a second moment of area number or an area number and, and, and experiment with, with modifying what you treat as your inputs. And similarly, you can, you can, you can look at what the, what, the, what the different responses are if you've gathered enough, enough data. Um, almost at the end, uh, evaluate the model. So this is where you generate a model and the question is, is does this represent reality? Um, and there's a few ways to do it. The simplest way is, a, is the statistical R square value, which is just a kind of, the sort of standard error of the, of, of the data points versus your, um, your predicted points. And um, this is a couple, couple of, it's useful, but it's got a couple of flaws. And generally we're looking at 70% plus type of range for it to be kind of seen as being reasonable, but that's definitely not a hard and fast rule. And um, there are a couple of downsides. It is influenced quite a lot by having more and more predictors. The predictors are just more kind of um, sort of groups within the, with, 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 or different factors, I should say, within the, within the equation that makes up, up the model. So if you, Add in lots and lots and lots and lots of different um, descript, um, yeah, so the predictors, I should say, you get a better R squared value just by default. And so the R squared adjusted value tries to compensate for that. But even better is the R squared predicted value, which almost takes it, it, it goes against, and I've put in, in the bullet point down here, that a big challenge about R squared and these types of ways of looking at your model quality is that the data that you're using to test your model performance is all is, is also the data that's been used to train the model. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest going here. So you'd expect it would be better um, than if you used it to, to predict sort of new data that wasn't used. And that's what the R squared predicted does. It, it, I think it's an, al an algorithm that allows the model to be created without one of the data points included. And then it uses that partial data set to predict the extra data set. And it, uh, the extra data point, and then it, it uses that to to to, to assess. So that's actually a much better way of seeing how 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 good your model is at predicting new data. And then lastly, I think this is this is a this is a typical output from Minitab, which I guess is one of the sort of typical bits of software used for this type of analysis. And you know, there's not a lot of metrics here that say this is good, this is bad, but it allows you to kind of just use your your own neural networks. I've said here um, to to um, to try and see patterns. And if you see patterns, it means that the residual changes are, um, as the observation order changes, it means that something systematic is happening. So it just allows you to kind of get a feel for things that aren't quite right. So, you know, 
rely on your gut instinct a little bit to, to help pinpoint issues with the model. And then finally, what do you do with it? So once you've got the model, you've essentially got an equation of how your system works. So this is where you've got the value. Now you understand how things interact. You can change settings and see what happens to the output. You can explore trade-offs and compromises and these types of things. Um, but essentially, all, 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 the, all, these, uh, all, all these packages will give you some kind of formula. And you could keep it in the package. You know, some mini tabs it's got some ways of visualizing things, but I don't think they're great. You can take it out and stick it in Excel, and you can develop little slider models that can allow you to kind of explore this multidimensional space uh, and become a bit more familiar with what the what their interactions are. And then obviously you can run kind of you can run optimization kind of um, algorithms to try and find the, the minimum for for various sort of bounded levels of the of of, of the inputs. Um, knowing what the what the DOE says is the model relationships is also quite useful in trying to work backwards and say, well, is there a theoretical model that we could base on? Now, now I, I know more about the system and how it works. Can I relook and see is there some kind of more fundamental principle about how we should how we should how we how we could model it in a more traditional way? And then lastly, I think there's a a, a nice chart that, that again many time produces that sort of standardizes the the relative effect of, 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 of different of different parameters and it allows you just to sort of quickly gauge which ones are important which ones are not so I'd, I'd recommend using that so it's been a whistle stop tour and I probably have gone a bit over um, but I think design of experiments is a great tool when you're working on complex systems that cannot be modeled using conventional theory um, and it really does unlock the opportunities that model-based development activities um, offer for these systems that, that conventionally you might struggle to you might struggle to um, produce a kind of accurate math model of. So, thank you for listening. Uh, I think there might hopefully there might be some questions. Okay, so the first question we have is how would you get over the institutional resistance to DOE that can exist in some places? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, point. I think coming from like a Six Sigma background, there's, there's or, or at least uh, ex being through the Six Sigma world in, in my time as an engineer, I think often there's a bit of pushback to that. You know, it can, it can look a little bit, um, all encompassing and it can sort of dominate people's thinking sometimes and so I, I think trying to kind of understand well what what was it for de decoupling it maybe from this whole kind of ecosystem of Six Sigma projects you know if, if it's if it's a specific area that you want to optimize decoupling it for that trying to understand exactly what you're trying to do trying to make the make the make the the, the, the test plan efficient so that you're not asking people to do umpteen different tests that, that, that maybe don't have a huge amount of value so so be efficient be iterative with it you know do a test plan analyze it use that to inform where you're going with with, with the testing so that you can just make sure there's kind of learnings coming back and there's kind of value seen early on in the process as opposed to doing a whole bunch of test work and then having a question marks over the model at the end and not having any way of kind of rectifying that Great, thank you. Um, another question is, how many factors are too many when designing for a complex problem? Good, good question. I think it depends on how you handle it. I mean, I've seen in my time in the automotive industry, um, DOEs are really widely used for, for calibrating gasoline and diesel engines where you've got upwards of 15 independent variables to do with, you know, turbochargers and intake exhaust cams and fuel and spark. And I, umpteen things and, and you want every operating point to be optimum and you know these generally used um, machine learning algorithms and um, but did open up massive and i really mean massive um cost and efficiency savings over over conventional kind of sweeping camshafts and sweeping ignition timing etc ways, ways ways of optimization so so you know i've i've seen 15 plus variable doe's adding tremendous value um, so I don't quite know where the limit would be but uh, you know somewhere up there I suspect yeah thank you uh, this one might follow on quite nicely we, we just hit time but we'll just answer one more um, what are the most common problems encountered by startups in DOE for hardware devices 
Um, I think uh, I think probably get, the, the the challenge when you when you when you try and set up an experiment, it's quite daunting. The the the, the experimental design element is is difficult to nav navigate, particularly if you're kind of constrained by certain the data sets that are attributed and are variable. And then when you go into a, a program like Minitab, it says, oh, you can't do that experiment if you've got this combination. And so I think I, I would say that just just starting it is, is difficult. And so, and I think that comes with the fact that these kind of theoretical models exist. And so it's nice to use them because there's some level of efficiency, but ultimately the value from my point of view is just to, is just to get data and to analyze that data. Even if that data is not the perfect data set, the more data you've got, or, or just analyzing some data gives you an understanding into the system and, and will help direct you where to go. And so I, I think getting kind of caught up in the test planning is, 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 a, is a real risk. Um, because, you know, if you, you decide all the ones you want to do and suddenly out pops like a 300 line test plan, which is just impossible to do, it can kind of just kind of put a stop to it. But actually, maybe you've already got data that you can just analyze. Maybe maybe there's other ways to collect data that's maybe slightly out with the formal DOE process, and you can kind of amalgamate it together and analyze it. So I think there's just lots of ways to be a bit more flexible with how you how you plan the test so that you're not kind of left with this big intimidating, do I, do I use a Taguchi or do I use a full factorial or these kind of things that are, are quite inaccessible.